Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, I'm really glad to be able to participate in this event. I met Wahid uh, several times at the Ethics uh, in Economics Networks at annual meeting in Europe. And I will remember him not only for being one of the best, uh, um, doing the best, one of the best works at the intersection of political philosophy and economics, but also for, I think, having one of the best instances of British humor, in spite not even being uh, British. <laughs> and um, uh, one of my favorite memory was a walk that Nicholas Brusalis Wahid and I took at the um, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris in 2019, where we discussed, I think, three great topics life, tenure, and the wrong of capitalism, <laughs> if any. And so I thought it would be appropriate to actually give a talk today on these last topics, where I will start by taking issues with what I will call the radical Republican critique of capitalism, of which I take Nicholas, not Wahid, to be an exponent. And then I will conclude by explaining what I think Wahid's work importantly contribute not to the critiques, but uh, to, uh, to going beyond such critique in an important way. So um, just to clarify, by capitalism, I, I mean an economic system where the means of production are privately owned, the allocation of resources between productive and non-productive activities is made primarily through markets and investment decisions are largely in private hands. Now, against existing critiques, so for example, the Rawlsian critique of welfare capitalism that predominantly focuses on distributive outcomes, Anderson critique that focuses on employers oppressing employees at the point of production, or exploitation-based critiques that focus on the actual extraction of surplus values. So against all these critiques, I see the main original contribution of the radical Republican critique as the attempt to defend the view that the distinctive wrong of capitalism is neither distributional nor merely interactional nor purely contingent. And this contribution, I take it, can be unpacked in three further theses. So the first is what I will call the non-contingency <clears throat> thesis. So the capitalist mode of production would be unjust even if it did not result in unjust distribution, even if it was democratically authorized, and even if capitalists were benevolent and did not actually exploit. Whereas under capitalism, for example, it is possible to find workplaces which are neither oppressive nor exploitative, for the benevolent capitalist, if benevolent, like precisely like the benevolent slave master may decide to not exercise his extractive powers. However, those who own the means of production always have qua owners the power to unilaterally control the labor of non-owners who must work to access subsistence. And this is in and of itself pro tanto unjust. Second, what I will call the domination thesis, that is, the owner's unilateral control over labor is pro tanto unjust because it amounts to a form of domination, as it either violates Kantian freedom as independence or neo republican freedom as non-domination. And the third thesis is what I will call the structural injustice thesis. So what is unjust about capitalism is not the mere fact that some particular individuals happen to have a certain kind of control over others, but that a social structure, the capitalist mode of production, unjustly confers this power to them. So in what follow, we'll try to argue that the radical Republican critique, at least so far, <laughs> can prove really neither the capitalist injustice is intrinsic in this way, nor that uh, such injustice amounts to a form of domination, nor I think can still make full sense of uh, structural injustice under capitalism. But importantly, I think the point of my critique, I want to be clear, is not to disparage radical republicanism, which I actually find very important and intellectually interesting, 
but rather is to ask this question, which is to what extent republicanism, even its most radical interpretations, can really be a promising ground for a critique of capitalism. And while developing this critique, I also hope to make some positive points about how to think the concept of capitalism, the relationship between ownership and domination, and the moral defect involved in being subject to impersonal market for forces, which will lead me to Wahid's work. So do owners always dominate? Where radical Republicans seem to assume the ownership of the means of production is sufficient to confer to owners the power to unilaterally control labor and those to dominate. But is this assumption warranted? So here is Nicholas, because the seed corn, the means of production, is concentrated in a few hands, so is the value of the net product it helps produce. And since unilateral control over the net product confers unilateral control over labor through the labor market, the seed corn, the means of production, becomes something it was not in a non-capitalist economy, namely control over persons in the form of control over a thing. So the seed corn becomes capital. Now, I think this classically Marxian economic account seems to assume that first savings from past labor are sufficient to enable the capitalists to reinvest into further production. And because of this unilateral control over the net product of past labor accumulated sequence in the form of ownership claim rights over the use of such products is sufficient to confer to the owner unilateral control over labor. And further, the capitalist profit and those savings to be reinvested in further production, so the value of produced seacorns, results from the extraction of surplus values from labor. Now, I take it that one possible problem with this assumption, at least re reading Keynes, is that past savings or profits are not sufficient to further production. They're not sufficient because further production necessitates investment in productive capital goods. And the overall amount, as well as the direction of this investment, does not depend on the amount of past savings, or at least not only, but rather on investors' subjective expectations concerning the likely prospective earning capacity of specific capital goods. So given the presence of money as a store of value, which is a distinctive part of capitalism, investors can always choose between either investing in specific capital goods and those to further production, or instead they can exercise their liquidity preferences and choose to hoard, thereby foregoing productive investment. Now, this means that physical factors of production, whether it's machines, steel, or seed corns, do not become productive capital until they are capitalized. That is to say, attributed monetary value on the basis of investors' expectations about the future. So capital then in this view is not merely legal property or any resource um, endowed with inherent objective productive qualities. It is rather, sorry, legal property assigned a monetary value through an expectation driven process of investment. So as an illustrative example to clarify, take the massive deindustrialization of the US, Rust Belt in the 1980s, here, rates of fixed investment in manufacturing collapsed and 2 million jobs were lost. Throughout, however, neither the rate of past savings, the presence of workers willing to work, or the inherent productive capacity of plants and equipment in the factories changed. Rather, what happened is that the US Federal Reserve engineered the so-called Volcker shock. So when interest rates soared, expectations shifted and major potential investor in manufacturing 
chose to earn cash, thereby foregoing many factories, forcing many factories to shut down. So existing plants and equipment, this is my point, no longer counted as capital, even as their productive intrinsic qualities remained exactly the same. And if so, the, if the value of productive assets, whether machine or seed corns, inextricably depends on the expectation driven process of capitalization, so does then the profit the capitalists can extract. So, why does this Keynesian story may matter normatively? Well, I think because it shows that the fact that an agent has ownership rights over the means of production and even over the net product in the form of claim rights to control their use is insufficient to confer to the owner the actual power to unilaterally control the working lives of others and those to dominate them. Because no single owner, indeed not even the capitalist class as a whole, has unilateral control over the process of monetary valuation of the net product from which future production and thus the acquisition of the power to dominate labor depends. Hence, I would argue that private ownership of the means of production and of accumulated past labor is insufficient for domination. And importantly, therefore, for Republicans, the capitalist is not like the benevolent master who, because he has ownership rights over the slave, ipso facto, also has the actual power to interfere with the slave. The difference is that the existence of the master's power of interference in the case of slavery is not conditional on an external process of monetary valuation. So whereas Republicans may affirm that slave masters always dominate, they cannot instead claim that those who own the means of production always do so. But one could say, well, what's, what's the problem? Um, some owners make money, some lose them, some retain the power to dominate, some do not, but all in all, there is always some domination, and this is enough. But recall that, as I said, a major advantage of the radical Republican critique, as I take it, over alternative critiques, especially focused on actual exploitation, is supposed to be that only the radical Republican critique can prove that injustice under capitalism is not contingent on the preferences of particular agent. But of course, radical Republicans must agree that complete absence of exploitation is also impossible under capitalism. For in their own economic account, capitalism could not reproduce itself if no capitalist actually extracts surplus values from labor. Therefore, the non-contingency thesis, I think, can only be understood as the claim that whereas the total amount of exploitation is contingent on particular agents, preferences, or disposition, by contrast, the total amount of domination is not, because owners, qua owners, always dominate. But so interpreted, I've argued, the non-contingency thesis seems to be flawed because owners of the means of production do not, in fact, always dominate. And importantly, how much domination exists under capitalism remains contingent on the subjective expectations of particular investors. But I, I want to leave this point aside, and I think we need further to ask, right? does the owner's unilateral control over labor necessarily amount to domination? Now, radical Republicans argue that the capitalist mode of production violates either Kantian freedom or neo-republican non-domination or both. So here, with some hesitation, because I, I know I am in a room full of Kantians, <laughs> I feel a bit embarrassed, but... Uh, um, um, so starting with the Kantian route, so, the claim here 
made is that work relationships under capitalism are incompatible with freedom as independence because they involve constraint by another's choice insofar as one agent unilaterally, that is to say, non-reciprocally control the labor process of another. But it seems to me that what violates Kantian independence is not just unilateral, but merely unilateral control. So for example, I am a homeowner unilaterally controls what others can do with their body, for she has the right to bind another to stay out of her place. But the homeowner's unilateral control can be omnilaterally authorized, arguably compatible, compatibly with everyone's freedom, such that it's not merely unilateral, and as such, it does not subject anyone to the purely private and legislative will of another. So then the question, the central question becomes, can unilateral control over labor be omnilaterally authorized? Now, not everything can be omnilaterally authorized. I think compatibly with freedom, most notably say the omnilateral will cannot will a system of slavery or even a system of property that leaves some completely dependent on the discretionary will of another for access in subsistence. But the first reason for the latter limitation is that a system of property that allowed such complete form of dependency would violate the same ground, arguably, that justifies property rights to begin with, property rights being necessary condition for freely exercises the capacity for human purposes. But it seems to me that Unlike complete lack of property, work relationships under capitalism would not seem to be necessarily incompatible with the capacity of non-owners to pursue ends as such. So with their purposiveness, a must, they would undermine what, for example, Nicholas called their productive purposiveness. That is to say the ability to independently set and pursue productive ends or ends through production. But it is unclear why independence should pick this specific kind of purposiveness, because as a free being, right, I might arguably entitled to set and pursue my ends, but not to the free pursuits of any specific ends or of ends through specific means. So in principle, people can still form and pursue many ends that do not concern production, and in many contexts outside of the work relationships, if some conditions are made available through regulation and other things. So perhaps the reason why unilateral control over labor could not be omnilaterally authorized is that if someone is fully dependent on, say, an employer, she cannot retain the ability to freely legislate as a political subject. But if, as Kant argues, the European carpenter who can put the product of his work up for sales to the public can qualify as an active citizen, even if the carpenter is obviously still dependent for her survival on the goodwill of a multiplicity of private buyers, then it's unclear to me why also why all, why we can regard also laborers as active citizens as long as they're not dependent for their survival on any particular employer. So it remains unclear then why the unilateral will cannot authorize a system of unilateral control over labor if regulation can secure sufficiently competitive labor markets, substantive exit option, and a good degree of leisure time. So from a Kantian perspective, capitalism may dominate, but it does so only contingently. But what about the neo-Republican route. Um, here, the idea is that um, unilateral control over labor amounts to domination in the neo-Republican sense because producers have arbitrary power, presumably of interference over non-owners. But the problem I see with it is that yeah. if interference, as neo-Republicans argue, consists in the removal or replacement of options for choice, then the capitalist producer power is not one of interference. 
indeed by having the power to offer a job to the non-owner and also to control the conditions of employment, the producer only has the power to add options, however bad this might be, rather than to remove them. So there is no here, the owners of the units of production, in this respect, I want to be clear, can both oppress and exploit, but it seems not to dominate, at least in the technical sense of domination by the Republicans. And so I also find this defense of the domination thesis problematic. Now, at this point, it could be argued that individual producers do not dominate, but capitalism as an economic structure still dominates. And this is what makes capitalism inherently unjust. Here, there are different kinds of radical republicans, which I, go, I can't go through it, but given that I focus on particularly on, on one version of it, I will stick with it. And if in this definition provided by Versailles, um, at any given instance of domination counts as structural just when it involves a triadic relationships between dominator, dominated, and regulator, any social role that contributes non-contingently to the reproduction of the dominator, dominated diet. Uh, but if that's the case, I'm not sure how we can say that capitalism reproduces the dominator, dominated diet, diet, diet if, uh, as I've argued, producers do not, in fact, dominate non-producers. Further, even if we assume that there is structural domination under capitalism, such domination would not be unjust, it seems, as opposed to be merely bad, unless it is reproduced through culpable action. Yet, interestingly, radical Republicans have moved closer to Marx in arguing that under capitalism, actors have no reasonable alternatives but to comply with the structural imperatives of the market, a point that why he also emphasizes in this book, and that being a capitalist is a social role, the occupant of which is substitutable, such that refraining from acting in a structure compliant way would not mitigate the reproduction of domination. So this seems to me maybe even right descriptively, but if this is the case, it remains unclear in what sense capitalism or capitalist unjustly dominate. What may be unjust is simply the failure to discharge ex post remedial re responsibilities to overcome badness, but then this remedial responsibility can be shared by a lot of people beyond capitalist themselves. But now I'm, I want to move to the, what I, uh, you know, it's the part that relates to Wahid, which is this question, imagine I'm completely wrong, uh, radical republicanism is a good critic of capitalism, but is it an important question of whether this is sufficient? It, is it a sufficient critique? Now, it seems to me that um, Wahid's book illuminates two important aspects neglect by this critique. First, that there is much more than labor relationships to capitalism. Money, consumption, and I would say in particular investment markets, um, all deserves much more centrality in a normative analysis of capitalism. And second, that there can be perhaps something morally defective with subjection to a system of rules that displays our judgment, even if such system is purely impersonal and does not therefore dominate us in a Republican sense. And I think that appreciating both facts leads us to focus on two important aspects of markets, and in particular of investment markets are impersonal forces. One is that capitalism displaces our judgment, but not only in the sense well illustrated by Wahid, that markets draw us into certain patterns of activity in a way that bypasses our individual judgment, but also in the sense that capitalism, by leaving investment to private markets, depoliticizes transformative decisions that determine the future course of society thereby bypassing our collective judgment 
about these transformative decisions. So here I have in mind decision concerning the overall rate of investment and therefore growth, as well as the extension and the direction of overall production. And so what kind of jobs will exist and also in part what kind of values I think will be endorsed in society. Um, the second feature is what I think socialist economists call the anarchy of production. And here I'm, I'm less optimistic than Waid on the efficiency of investment market in particular. And I'm not spending time, but it's possible that consumer market and investment markets are different in this respect. So here the idea is that not only these markets do not count all the important values that, that might be out there, but uh, um, they work according to a logic which requires that investors act not on the basis of what they reflectively believe is valuable or useful, but rather on their guesses concerning other investors' expectations of future profit and their condition are often radical uncertainty. So in the absence of any conscious planning, such markets are structurally prone to deliver wasteful and irrational systems of production. Now, what I call the problem of depoliticization, it seems to me, matters morally because we may say it impairs the conditions that will make it reasonable for, see, for citizens to see and to affirm their society as the product of their joint cooperation rather than as the result of largely uncontrollable market forces. The feature of anarchy instead also matters because it prevents citizens from relating to their society as an object worthy of affirmation, either because the result is an anarchic system that lacks sufficiently coherent unity to be affirmed or because it cannot reflect their reflectively endorsed priority. So then the interesting question, and I confess that I'm still uh, not sure about this, but it seems to me, what's the problem here? So it's not one of domination or equality, because as Wahid rightly points out, there is no subjection to a particular will, but rather to impersonal market forces. But I doubt that the problem is one of authoritarianism either, as, as Wahid understand it, that is to say a subjection to a governance scheme which fails to meet requirements of reason, sensitivity, transparency, and trustworthiness. And to see why, so imagine that an important part of your life, including transformative decisions concerning your future, whether to have children or what career to pursue, was governed by a very reason-sensitive, transparent and trustworthy computer machine, which would reliably make decisions on your behalf that you could reasonably endorse and did so in a transparent way, but without you having any direct involvement in those decisions. Now, I take it that your subjection to the computer machine would not be authoritarian in a wide sense, but it seems to me that the arrangement would still be large morally defective. And the reason is that you would not be able, you would not be in a position to understand and affirm your resulting life as the product of your own actions. Because your agency will not be directly involved in guiding your life, you will be in turn unable to understand and affirm your life as your own. You will be, in other words, alienated from your life. So I know that the alienation concept, I mean, it's, it's very hard to pin down analytically, but you know, so far I have an intuitive uh, sense. So similarly, I would say that capitalism structurally generates a morally defective because alienated relation between citizens and their society. And the reason is that under capitalism, citizens are alienated because due to what I call the politicization, they can understand and affirm their society as the result of their joint cooperation and because of anarchy, they cannot relate to it in an affirmative way. 
So in fact, I think a pervasive sense of both powerness and detachment, not a sense of ingratiation or subordination, are the most common phenomenological expression of relationship between citizens and political societies under advanced capitalism. So, and this is my last slide. So if this is the problem, what is the solution then? Well, it seems to me not a system of co-determination and intermediate capitalism as Wahid supports it, because this would be partly insufficient, but not even the workers' ownership and control of, of socialist and radical republicanism. Rather, the solution would seem to be in order to respond to the, the politicization and anarchy simultaneously, a socialization and democratization as well as importantly, the planning of investment. And here I leave open, you know, of how exactly institution, I mean, I have in mind these participatory planning models defended by socialist economy, for example, Pat Devine, but I will leave that uh, uh, out there. Yeah, thank you.